Hello, and welcome to Dear SQL DBA, a podcast for SQL Server developers and database administrators. I'm Kendra Little. This week, I'm going to talk about when things go upside down a little bit in SQL Server. I'm going to talk about the times when SQL Server does not use write-ahead logging and some related facts that go along with how our data is stored and how it is recoverable when SQL Server isn't using write-ahead logging. This is episode number 35. Before I dig in too much, I want to let you know about some new free stuff I've got over at SQLWorkbooks.com. I still have two online video courses that you can enroll in now and get access until the end of 2017. Those courses are Troubleshooting Blocking and Deadlocks for Beginners and Tuning Problem Queries in Table Partitioning. I've also got a new online reference. This is a little bit different than the courses. The courses have videos where I walk you through demos and I explain uh, concepts to you. In the SQL Server Management Studio Shortcuts and Secrets, it is a bunch of really short, silent videos. Each video is one minute or less, and it uses indications on the screen. It's a, a, a video of a demo, and I show you what keystrokes I'm pushing and narrate you through it just using stuff on the screen so you can learn it by reading it, and you don't have to worry about getting headphones. These are more like long animated GIFs than like a real video. Below each demo, I've got a summary of the shortcut keys that I use in it so you can read them there as well. And also as of today, I have added in a fun little poll for each video so you can weigh in on one of the things shown in the demo. And then after you take the poll, see how other people feel about it also. I think it should be lots of fun. I also added uh, two new lessons to it today. This is uh, with the Management Studio Shortcuts and Secrets. I'm gonna keep adding things in there over time. The two I added today are things like how to type on multiple lines at once in Management Studio, how to use regular expressions to find and replace tabs to format code. And then I've also got lots of stuff in there like how to use the splitter bar to edit multiple parts of the same session at once. Really useful shortcut keys, lots of fun stuff. So enroll in Management Studio Shortcuts and Secrets now. And as I add new stuff, it will automatically get added into your account. You don't have to like re-sign up or anything like that later. Really having fun with that new course. I plan to add a poster to it soon. Tons of stuff I want to do. And it's it's funny, I've also, I've just been having fun with, you know, SQL workbooks. The new business has been going really well and it's almost tax time here in the United States. But the, the thing that has really made it feel like a legitimate company is that I got stickers with the logo on it. <laughs> the SQL workbooks logo on stickers has made me really feel like this is really happening. <laughs> My new business is actually real. Other fun stuff. While I was in Portugal, I went to Portugal and I taught a one day session before SQL Saturday Portugal. I taught on indexes on classic row store tables. And then the day after I taught that session, I attended a another pre-conference session. I attended a session by Kaylin Delaney on in-memory technology. And it was really, it was great. I, I love teaching training sessions. I love attending them. And Kaylin is a fantastic teacher. So it was really interesting. And it was funny because I, I pre-recorded some podcast episodes before I left town so that the podcast could publish while I was out. And I think that on the day before I attended Kaylin's session on Hecaton, I think that the day before my episode about write ahead logging went live, and in that episode, I talk about how learning about write-ahead logging in SQL Server was a real light bulb moment for me. And it helped illuminate all of this stuff about how SQL Server uses the transaction log, how data is stored in data files, and how all this stuff works. It, it made it easier for me to understand all these other concepts. 
And then the day after that episode goes live, I go to this session on in-memory OLTP and everything is upside down. <laughs> There's all of this stuff that's different, which to me is so exciting. And I realize if I was to go back and re-record that podcast episode on Write Ahead Logging, I'd have a little slide at the beginning that was like, what I'm talking about today does not apply to Hecaton. <laughs> It's 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 true and it's accurate for everything except in-memory OLTP in SQL Server. When it comes to in-memory OLTP, do not assume that anything is the same. Just don't assume. <laughs> Cuz it's really a, it's rebuilt from the ground up and it does things differently. It was really rewritten from the ground up. I mean, the in-memory OLTP AKA Hecaton uses a lot of the same parts of your SQL server. And it's kind of cool how integrated it is. You see everything in management studio. It uses the same transaction log file in a database as other tables, but in order to make things really, really fast, they really do not appear to have stuck to any of the, like the uh, rules about how they did it before. Things are very, very different when you look at them closely and it's all designed to get around specific bottlenecks for OLTP style workloads, workloads that want to do very lots of very small, very fast modifications to a table. So I'm gonna to try to keep the terminology right when I, when I talk about this stuff today. Terminology is tough and it's really hard to not say the wrong word by accident. But brief overview, when we talk about tables in SQL Server, we have disk-based tables. These are the classic tables that we know and love. Uh, the tables we've had for a really long time are row store tables that are stored in our data files in SQL Server. Yeah, when we insert data, we write ahead to the log but data is flushed down from memory into the data files and that's where those tables live. So if we're gonna do a read and the data we need for these classic row store disk based tables, if the data we need isn't in memory, we'll go to the data file and read the data into memory so we can access it. Our column store tables for the most part, our column store tables are also disk-based and not required to be in memory. If we have a, a disk-based clustered column store index, or if we create a non-clustered column store index on a disk-based row store table, it, it uses columnar format, but the same thing is true. Like if the store it in the data files, if we need it in memory, we'll read it from the data files and pull it into memory. These new in-memory OLTP tables, otherwise known as Hecaton, are, they live in memory. That is where our data is, it is in memory. You can create column store on an in-memory table and that column store table is different than other column store tables. And I'm not gonna dig into <laughs> all of the details of that, that's super specialized topic. But of course, there's always like an exception that makes your slide more complicated, right? And that's the one where you're like, well, some column store are on in memory OLTP tables and they're, they have different requirements. So when we're writing into end memory OLTP, we're putting data in this table that lives in memory and is specially architected to make these OLTP actions really, really fast. We do write to the transaction log if we've said we want the end memory OLTP table to be durable. When you create these end memory tables, you get to say whether or not you want the data to be there after you restart the SQL Server instance, right? Because the data is in memory. And if we cut the power and the data was only in memory, <laughs> like if we hadn't put the data anywhere else besides memory, if the power to the server went away or we restarted it, the data would just be gone. So when you create your in-memory OLTP table, you get to say whether or not you want it to be durable. And if you say you want it to be durable, when writes happen, it will write information to the transaction log for the database. 
the very same transaction log you're using for other things, but it doesn't use write ahead logging. It does logging, but not write ahead logging. It waits until you commit your transaction to write it to the log. It writes at commit time. This is different. Like if I do begin tran and I do a bunch of, you know, insert, insert, delete, insert, it's not going to go and put anything in the transaction log until I say commit for in memory OLTP, AKA Hecaton. In other words, so I'm not writing ahead. I'm just writing at commit. And what I write for that transaction is just in one big log record. So, and this is done to try to optimize the writes to the log so it's not super chatty and it's just putting this in one big log record. So that's different. It's not write ahead logging, it is logging for the durable tables. There's another thing that's different. It doesn't write this in memory stuff to your data file. All of our other tables, you know, they're resident in the data files and memory OLTP, OLTP doesn't do that. It has a different form of files that it will use if you want your tables to be durable. Like if you want the data back after a failover or a power outage or whatever, it has something called checkpoint files. It doesn't only keep the information in the transaction log. And this makes sense because if we only kept the information in the transaction log, our transaction log would grow and grow and grow and become giant. And we're using it not just for our Hecaton and memory OLTP stuff, we're using it for other things too. So we need to be able to, you know, have chunks of that log be able to be reused. So we don't want <laughs> our durable you know, in memory tables, we don't want them to only be in the transaction log when it comes to disk. SQL Server, when you say you want to use in memory OLTP on the database, you have to create a special file group for in memory OLTP. And you create it, I mean, technically you're creating a file group. Like that's the, in the syntax you use in the T-SQL, or it says that in the GUI, but it's really, when you look at it, this file group that you're creating is a folder on disk that is full of a bunch of files. These are called checkpoint files. <laughs> now, I mentioned in my last presentation, I, have a, I had a drawing where I was like, and SQL Server doesn't ever copy from the log file to the data file. Now that's totally true because SQL Server doesn't copy from the log file to the data file. It doesn't do that for any kind of table. But I, on the, it, the funny thing to me is on the, my notes in PowerPoint about this, I was, I basically, I, I wrote, SQL Server doesn't do anything crazy like copy from the log file to the data file. So that is technically accurate, but there is actually something similar-ish <laughs> that happens for in-memory OLTP. And it's, it's kind of interesting and crazy. And memory OLTP, like it writes to the, when you, when you commit a transaction, it writes that whole transaction to the transaction log in, in an optimized log record. And then after it's in the transaction log over time, it, do, it doesn't want the transaction log to have to keep growing. So it has processes for in memory OLTP that look at this data in the transaction log file, and it's it's only got committed committed rows for in memory OLTP because it happens at commit time, and it synchronizes it over to the checkpoint files that are just for the in memory OLTP stuff. And if you are using in memory OLTP, this is important to know because if your transaction log is growing and growing and growing, knowing okay, I've got to have, uh, you know, all of this stuff in my log, like whether or not my log needs to grow or it can reuse part of it is dependent on whether it has copied, you know, which transactions it has successfully populated in the checkpoint files so that if the power is cut when SQL Server starts up, it is able to populate my data correctly because it'll use those checkpoint files to populate your in-memory tables, as well as your transaction log, because I may have some transactions that are in, you know, if the power just goes out, I've got some stuff 
that is in my transaction log that hasn't made it over to the checkpoint files yet. So I was like, SQL Server never copies to the data files. And that's true, but SQL Server does copy data from the transaction log over into the checkpoint files. And I shouldn't say copy. It's it's not like it it's, you know, just like, it's not like the checkpoint file is just the same format as the transaction log. Don't want to say that. It is quite complicated what is in these checkpoint files. There are different types and they can be merged and there's all sorts of, of complexity that goes on there. But there are uh, threads that read from the transaction log file when it comes to populating and managing the checkpoint file. So as I was learning this and I'm like, wow, wow, wow. It was like, you know, this explosion of wow is in my head. So it was a good day. And also interesting, I mean, also kind of mind blowing to me and in a good way is the fact that we now have the option to do non-logged tables in, in memory OLTP. Remember how I said you can choose as to whether you want the data to be there after you restart the SQL server. If you want the data to be there after you restart the SQL server, it's going to be logged. But if you don't, and sometimes you really don't, like I've worked with lots of different processes that use temporary objects or temporary staging tables in different ways where we're going to run a bunch of code that's going to populate and manipulate data in some objects for a little while. And if this code fails, if it's interrupted for any reason, the next time we run it, we're just going to start from scratch. We're not going to go look at anything mid-flight. We're just going to reiterate the process. We don't care if the data in those temporary objects is lost. Well, with in-memory tables, if you create them as non-durable, the data that you put into them is not going to go into your transaction log. And that is kind of awesome. <laughs> in fact, that's really, really awesome. With our classic stuff in SQL Server, there are ways to achieve minimal logging and to minimize logging, to log less. But this is the way to say, I don't want to log any of the data that I'm inserting. This isn't going to make everything faster. It's only going to be suitable to really specific things. But of course, it's really easy to imagine a lot of cases where you're like, oh, this could be extremely powerful. And there are some things where just using it for really select uses could make things much, much faster. And now that in SQL Server 2016, Service Pack 1 and later, now that we have the option to use in-memory OLTP, even in standard edition and lower editions in SQL Server, with some limitations, we don't get all the functionality, but there are some interesting scenarios that come to light that don't require enterprise edition, right? So very, very cool, just the different ways to potentially uh, use this and speed things up, even in parts of your application that aren't the most critical where you don't have enterprise edition. So lots to learn <laughs> if you're gonna use this stuff. Resources to learn more. Kaylin has a white paper out on in-memory OLTP in SQL Server 2016. It's got sections on the transaction logging, as well as all these checkpoint files and tons more stuff. The 2016 version of her in-memory OLTP book will be publishing soon with Redgate. She said that that should be coming out soon. The 2014 version of that has a free PDF download available. So um, that might, I, I don't know 100%, but there may be some cool free stuff available for the 2016 book as well. Also, if you're wondering, well, how do I know if something's going to be faster with in-memory OLTP? If you are a member of the SQL Skills Insider Group, they send out a newsletter. I think it's every, I think it's two a month. I think it's bi-weekly, but it's not twice a week. I think it's twice a month. You know, that term's always crazy. But Erin Stilato of SQL Skills and a recent newsletter, it was number 149. She did a demo and published the scripts for an example of how you could test a process and look at weight stats and perf counters and all sorts of cool stuff. I, I think the perf counters were involved. It's actually been a couple of weeks since I watched the video, but I watched it. It was great. Join the SQL Skills Insider newsletter and then on the blog post uh, associated with this on littlekendra.com, 
I'll put in the show notes a link to uh, where you can download those if you aren't on the newsletter already. But if you aren't on the newsletter, you should totally join because they regularly publish really cool uh, demos on different topics in there. I wanted to also thank SQL Saturday Portugal for a fantastic event. I had a terrific time teaching and learning and meeting other people. And I received, I know you can't see this in the audio version, but I received a giant orange fish <laughs> that I traveled with to the Algarve coast. And then through Amsterdam on the way home, I managed to fit a giant stuffed orange fish into my luggage. It was a, it was a miracle. <laughs> Thank you, Andre, for, <laughs> for one of the strangest gifts I've ever received, but, but I truly, I truly love it. And if you're like, well, I want to go to the beach in Portugal too, you have the opportunity. There is another conference coming up in Lisbon soon. It's called the Tuga IT Conference. Tuga is a nonprofit Portuguese association. So this isn't a SQL Saturday event like I went to. It's a different nonprofit putting on uh, three days. It's May 18th through 20th. It's three days in Lisbon at the Microsoft facility. It is a beautiful facility. And it's on SQL Server, but more stuff too. There's also sessions and workshops on SharePoint, on Office 365, Azure, more stuff. Slava Oaks of Microsoft is going. I think he's doing a workshop. Anthony Nocentino is giving a workshop as well, I believe. So check out and see if you could make a business trip to Portugal as well in May 2017 for the Tuga IT conference. And if you do, I highly recommend going down to the beaches around. I was in Faro and just really enjoyed the beaches and the food and the desserts and the friendly people. It is just a wonderful place to visit. I won't be at the Tuga IT conference, but if you go, I tweet your photos. I would love to see them. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you've got a question for Dear SQL DBA, I would love to hear it. And uh, today was a great day because I got a Dear SQL DBA question about availability groups that I actually managed to answer on the first reply. That now, if you have an availability group question, I'm going to warn you like that's, <laughs> that's the don't, don't expect that to happen. They are so complicated that my chances of actually knowing what the problem is right away are very low. And it might just be kind of like, ah, I can't tell from email, but I did. Oh, that was yes. Yes. Solved that one today. Please also check out sqlworkbooks.com and enroll in the courses. If you enjoy your courses there, I would love it if you left a review on the course. It will help my business long term, help others find the sites and figure out which courses help which people and why. Thanks so much for joining me for this podcast. I'll see you again next week.